You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 184, Hebrews chapters 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 20. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, I sincerely apologize for the beatdown that I put on you <laughs> this weekend for in fantasy. Well, I, I told you, you, you caught me at the perfect week. I had point a point beatdown almost. Yeah, well, I didn't have anybody to play, so that's how bye weeks work. Yeah. So, but, but, you know, I'm looking forward to the end of the season because one of your main guys will be on suspension. Well, we shall and see. So, He's back yeah, on. So, yeah, well, he yeah. won't be back on at the end of the year. He will serve time well, and it's going to be over the playoffs. <laughs> well, if he serves time now, he'll come back week 16, which will be the Super Bowl, which I will clearly be in. So, no, no. Uh, he, he's going to play this weekend. So the fact that he's, he's battling is going to shift it just enough. It shifts it to week. He returns week sixteen, which is uh, the Super Bowl, which I will be in. You're going to be out of the picture. That'll be my secret weapon. Yeah, you're Time not going to make it. Time. You're not going to make it that far without him. <laughs> well, probably not. Yeah, well, we shall see. It doesn't matter. I'll be at full strength then anyway. The yeah, pugs. Well, the pugs will be uh, looking for vengeance. I'm sorry to run your seven game win streak. Yeah. You're undefeated. You uh, you don't want to you don't want to run into an angry pug. Let me just tell you. <laughs> Do they get angry or they just get cuter and cuter? I'm sure Maury gets angry, but I can't tell. Yeah. <laughs> and for you know, uh, I don't know if I want to get into it. I was going to say something about Stranger Things. We have a, a new name for for Maury, but uh, oh, probably I'm don't not, have all I'm that only, many. I'm only on episode four. Okay. So don't, okay. I'm don't not going to say me. anything. Yeah. I'm not going to say anything to I'm you. Only on episode four. But, uh, so yeah, it, it generated a new a, a new name for Maury. So yeah. I'll just leave it at that. Awesome. Well, I'll try to guess what it is as I'm watching it. So that gives me something to <laughs> else to to do while I watch Stranger Things. Mike, also I want to mention that the conferences are coming up. So again, we will be covering those with. Uh, Mm-hmm. several interviews we have lined up and then also we're going to try to do a live q a like we did in san antonio and uh we're going to shoot for friday november 17th in boston mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so thereabouts um we're going to be looking for another coffee shop uh, we don't know where so if anybody lives in the boston area has any good ideas where's our hotel again exactly mike yeah the the for the for SBL it's in Woburn, Woburn. Massachusetts. So Woburn. yeah, it's a little it's outside central Boston. If there's any listeners out there that are in that area that knows a good coffee shop, send me an email, tracestrickland at gmail dot com and let me know. Uh, we'll try to set up Friday evening. We're gonna try to do a live Q and A recorded again and uh it'll be fun. Yeah, maybe maybe we'll get Burnett again, who knows? He I just saw on Facebook that he's already feeling a little harried now that he has to do some teaching and grade papers and stuff like that. So it just kind of made me laugh, <laughs> even though I didn't put anything on there. It's like, oh, well, you know, hey, there you go. Welcome to the club. So he's going to have to bring it with him. Like, like, you know, I bring my stuff with me to these conferences, too. So he's going to be a busy boy. Yeah. But we'll see. Well, good deal. All right, Mike. Well, back into Hebrews, I guess. Yep. Yep. Hebrews five eleven through the end of chapter 6. So technically it's Hebrews 5.11 through 6.20. And again, we decided to group things this way because there's a thematic relationship here. Uh, We're we're actually going to talk a little bit about priesthood again. But again, I I sort of caution people when we got into the priesthood of of Jesus in Hebrews, that's going to really extend on into chapter 10. So we, we just keep running into that. But then also the issue of you know, apostasy, uh, losing faith, okay, that, that sort of thing, or drifting away from faith or rejecting the gospel, again, for some other reason. But typically it's cast as the, the problem of unbelief, you know, losing faith. And Hebrews 6 is sort of known for that. So that's what we're going to hit on today. So let's just jump in to Hebrews 5.11. I'm going to read 11 through 14. We'll start out that way. Reading ESV again, we have, about this, we have much to say. The writer says, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. 
for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Now, this line here that Hebrews 5.11 opens with, about this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain. Well, what, what's hard to explain? What is the this that he's talking about? Well, I'm with most commentators here who would say that verses 7 through 10, again, the preceding you know, four verses to verse 11, are the immediate reference points. So let's just read those again. So Hebrews 5.7 through 10 says this, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So that's 7 through 10. Now that, that's the stuff that the writer says, boy, about this, we have much to say, and it's kind of hard to explain. Well, th there's a lot in there. I mean, we, we talked about this last time where you have a reference in verse 7, Jesus offering up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, again, apparently a reference to the Garden of Gethsemane scene. Interestingly enough, the writer here in Hebrew says that Jesus was heard. His prayers were heard, but how were they heard? Well, you know, he had to do the will of God. You know, remember that the, the prayer, you know, let, let this cup pass for me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will. And, and because that was the answer, and because Jesus was faithful, we have verse 8, although he, Jesus, was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. In other words, we talked about this last time, Jesus learned what it was to overcome weakness. Remember last time we talked about the, the passage where Jesus you know, had to go through all the weaknesses and the temptations that you know, are common to, to human beings, and he emerged on the other side sinless. And so in verse 9 here, you know, he, after he learns obedience, he, he learns what that's all about, you know, overcoming weakness of the flesh, because he's human in the incarnation idea. He learns obedience and being made perfect, verse 9, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So be, because he endured, because he conquered weakness, he conquered temptation, he was made perfect. He was validated. He was shown to be true, okay, in every way, nothing diminished, uh, no, no blemish at all. And he becomes, again, the, the, the perfect sacrifice. He fulfills the the role of high priest, verse 10, he's designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He performs the, his priestly duty, in this case, offering up himself uh, as a propitiation, as an atonement. And because he is eternal, then that sacrifice is eternal. He becomes the source, Hebrews 7, 9, of eternal salvation because of, it, again, his faithfulness in this. So, you know, th these things are difficult. You know, the, the, it's hard to explain. How could the Son of God learn obedience? Well, it's because he became a man. He lived through the weaknesses and temptations common to human experience. He learned to persevere and remain sinless despite, again, experiencing what it was to be human. Weakness, temptation to sin, he, he felt all those things. Another you know, issue, how is Jesus the source of eternal salvation, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek? Well, he's appointed that, but he, his obedience, his faithfulness, again, validate the appointment. He does what he was supposed to do. Um, and there's a lot of, of layers to this. You know, we've, we've seen some already in chapter 5. We've seen, uh, again, you know, that the priesthood idea is going to continue through, so we're going to be running into more of this. So the writer keeps kind of returning to this because this is what he really wants to talk about. This is the meaty stuff. He doesn't, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see in a moment what he sort of wants to get away from, what he wish he wouldn't, he, he doesn't have to talk about. But of course, you know, he want, he's in a situation with his readership that, you know, he has to go back and sort of rehearse, you know, the things they should have known, the things that they, they should already be mature and he shouldn't have to repeat. So he's, he's struggling, you know, with, with this a little bit. He says, this is the stuff that, that you should be ready for, but you're not. This is the good stuff. It's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. Okay, that's Hebrews 5.11 again. 
about this. We have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. So the problem isn't like an intellectual one, like, oh, this stuff is just too deep. You're, you're not smart enough to get it. No, it's because they become dull of hearing. Well, what what aren't they hearing? What aren't they getting? Let's just keep reading. And, and again, back into verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. You can't handle the solid food. And of course, the solid food is the stuff from verses 7 to 10, that, you know, the work of Christ, the order of Melchizedek, all that kind of stuff. You know, the incarnation, these are big topics. They're theologically significant topics. They have lots of layers to them, and they're, and they're deep. I think we've already you know, sort of seen that. And the writer's saying, well, this is what I, where I really want to park, but I can't. Verse 13, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Now, why is the writer's audience not ready for, for this? I mean, what, in this description, we just read again for the second time, verses 11 through 14. What, what, what are, the, are their problems? You know, what's going on here? Well, the writer says they're dull of hearing, they're low on discernment, they are apparently untrained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. We see in, in, that, in that little encapsulation, dull of hearing and low on discernment, of course, discernment again being defined as you, you're not practiced enough of, you know, on how to distinguish good from evil. We see a relationship there between spiritual maturity and understanding, comprehending the nature and point of Jesus' role as the mediator of eternal life, that his obedience is what satisfies God, is not just about intellectual understanding. Again, when, when he goes into them, them being dull of hearing and, and, and lacking discernment, he's referring to the stuff that, that he wishes he could teach them. And the stuff he wishes he could teach them are in these preceding verses, 7 through 10. It's the Melchizedek order. It's the incarnation. It's, it's you know, how, how eternal salvation is brought to humans and made possible, not by our works, not by anything we do, not by our obedience, but by his, by Jesus' obedience. That's the stuff that they're dull of hearing about. That's the stuff they're just, that's just not getting through. And they, you know, this, this whole idea of discerning good and evil, we, we tend to, to read that and think, well, that's about specific sins. You know, it's about moral behaviors. And, you know, there might be some of that in there, but at the very least, they are unable to discern, again, good and evil defined against verses 7 through 10. Well, what would be evil you know, about, you know, failing to understand incarnation, the priesthood of Melchizedek, again, the, the obedience of Christ, how Jesus learned obedience? What, what, what would be evil about that? Well, the, the answer is, should be kind of evident that either you don't comprehend what all this stuff accomplished for you and you're substituting your own obedience in there. Or you're just sort of rejecting it. You just you don't you don't want to believe. Either, either you're sort of unable to grasp it, and you're still kind of going back to, as he's going to say right in the in the very next verse in verse in chapter six verse one. You're, you you keep going back to to dead works. That that that's that's bad. That's evil. Okay. That 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 is something that the immature do. The people who are dull of hearing, because that results in death. Okay. That is not the basis of eternal life. It's not the basis of eternal sonship, eternal membership in the family of God. You know, the, the, the whole basis of that is what he's been talking about from the very first verse of the letter. Okay, when, when we got into, again, this, this language about Jesus being the radiance and, and you know, again, pre-existence and all this stuff, that's important because you mix that with incarnation and you have an eternal sacrifice. And, it, and it's through the obedience of that one, that person, Christ, that we have an entryway into the family of God. This this is, is should be our hope, the writer of Hebrews keeps saying. This should be the reason why you should be confident. You can be confident in Jesus. He didn't fail. You don't be confident in yourself because your dead works, even your best works, frankly, have, have nothing to do with this. Well, if you can't get away from that, then you're dull of hearing. You, you lack discernment. Okay, you're not discerning the true gospel from a false gospel which is not a good thing. So uh, while I'm, you know, I'm, I'm willing, of course, you know, to admit, because there, there are going to be places in the passage where, you know, there are issues of, of moral obedience and disobedience and that sort of thing. We, I, we tend to focus on that, at least a lot of preachers do that, that I've heard. We tend to focus on that, and we don't connect lack of discernment. We don't connect 
embracing good versus embracing evil with the knowledge of of who it is that actually achieved our salvation for us. I mean, that having a false gospel, a gospel that doesn't work, a, a different gospel, another gospel, that's not good. By definition, that would be, again, a, a theological or a, an evil in that sense, because it's going to result in destruction, you know, hell. So that's part, definitely, of what he's talking about. He hasn't even gotten, you know, to specific behaviors yet. He, he will. But at this point in Hebrews chapter 5, what he's talking about is the stuff that he just got, that we discussed on the last episode. This is how he's, he's connecting back into that. He's saying, I, I want to go on and talk about this stuff more because this is this is really the heart of the matter. This is really the, the guts, you know, of the gospel. But you're dull of hearing. It's just not getting through. And and you just lack discernment. I can't move on to the good stuff because you haven't grasped or embraced fully the fundamental things. And again, that that's just not a good thing. So there's a direct relationship again between understanding those things and you know comprehending the nature point of Jesus role as the mediator of eternal life that it's his obedience that satisfies God and not your own you know there's a direct relationship be- between you know understanding those things intellectually and and being spiritually mature uh, again just just as a sidebar here i mean i don't know how much, i wish i could had a dollar for every sermon i heard growing up that sort of you know wanted to dichotomize depth of knowledge with spirituality here the writer of Hebrews actually fuses them. He brings them together. So what should be happening is that the more you un- you understand about these doctrines and about Scripture, the more you understand biblical theology, it should produce maturity. But if if you lack again spiritual maturity, if if you really fail, you know, to grasp these things in your heart, not just your head, um, that's a problem. So you know, lack of discernment, lack of spiritual maturity is, in fact, related to what you understand, your knowledge of doctrine, your knowledge of of biblical theology. The the two are not mutually exclusive. Now, again, you know, this is what the writer's concerned about. We have, you know, we have a problem here. If I could say it this way, when we really grasp what grace means— and what the offer of eternal life really requires, that is belief, not our own performance, but belief. When we really grasp what that means, and, and that, that's what grace is, we can think of ourselves as spiritually mature. But, but that means grasping some really significant core theological ideas. Those who are spiritually mature understand grace. They really do. Those who are spiritually mature understand grace. And what do I mean by that? Well, they understand that eternal life is not about any merit of our own. The spiritually mature do not redefine the gospel in the wake of their own failures and sin. I mean, think about how many times we do this as believers. And and I know we can all think of somebody else that, that does this. Well, you know, think about your, yourself as well. I mean, in my own life, I had a I had a time where I really struggled with this. But if you're spiritually mature, if you really understand what the basis of salvation is, and who accomplished it. If you really understand, if you're spiritually mature, you're not going to redefine the gospel in light of your own failure, in light of your own sin. A sin is awful. It's disgraceful even at times. But since the offer of eternal life never hinged on your moral perfection or near perfection, your failures do not change your relationship to God through Christ, the spiritually mature person, the person who understands grace, will resist redefining the gospel in light of their own failure. Okay, that, that's just that's part of maturity. It's part of grasping theology, becoming mature. And then the writer in Hebrews is basically going to, basically going to point you know out that I still have a whole lot of you that that just this is where you're at. This is where you're at. You are redefining the gospel in light of your own failures. That shows me you don't understand it. It shows me you really don't understand it. Uh, another thought about forsaking faith, moving from belief to unbelief. That's really the only thing that can actually affect your standing before God. If, if you reject grace, if you reject the gospel, 
you know, and, and this is different. Let, let's just say that, that you're prone, you have a propensity to, to redefine the gospel in light of your own failures. Well, that doesn't mean you're rejecting it. But if you, if you, you know, mentally and, and in your heart, you know, let, let's just say, if you say, well, no, I believe this is the gospel. And I believe I have to have, you know, works. So I believe I have to do X, Y, or Z. And people who don't, I'm just going to label, well, they're, they're going to hell. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm trying to achieve perfection here. And I, I need to, to have eternal life. Okay, if, if you're there, if that's where you're at, then if that's your deliberate choice to redefine the gospel and then pursue it intentionally, you've, re- you've rejected the real gospel. And that's really the only thing, moving from belief in what God has done you know, through Christ, trading the true gospel to a false gospel. That's really the only thing that can affect you know, your, your standing before God. It's a rejection of the truth. Okay, you can only reject the gospel. You can only reject eternal life if you don't believe it. It has nothing to do with a specific sin that you commit. That's not what it's about. If you believe the gospel, you are eternally secure. If you don't, you're not. And I've said this many times in, in the series here on Hebrews already. The point is, is that you, you must believe. And, and it's very clear what you must believe. You must believe in the gospel as presented, you know, in not only the book of Hebrews, but the New Testament, you know, biblical theology. You have to believe who it is, you know, in who it is that accomplished your salvation. This has been the, the constant drumbeat of this book, book of Hebrews. It's about this one person, his faithfulness, not yours. You can stumble. He couldn't. Okay, if he stumbled, then we're all in a, in, in a, in a whole lot of trouble. But he didn't stumble. He was validated. He learned obedience through suffering. Okay, he he did perform the duty of of, of the high priest. He he did he did everything that needed to be done, so that you don't have to perform in a in a you know you don't have to have a certain track record of behavior to have eternal life. It's just not the point. But again, our propensity is again to add behavior to it, and in so doing, we redefine the gospel, which demonstrates that we are spiritually immature. We are not ready for real meat. We're not ready for the details. We're not ready to drill down because we're still struggling with, again, what should be apparent on the surface. So again, I'm I'm belaboring this because we're going to get into chapter six. Okay. You must believe to have eternal life. That is the, that is the, the, that's the, that's the requirement. You must believe. Believe what? Again, believe in, in, in the fact that God has accepted the work of Christ on your behalf. You believe in what he did, not in what you're doing or what you think you need to do. It has nothing to do with your own merit. You must believe. If, and if you do believe, if you believe the gospel, you're eternally secure. If you don't, you're not. Now, you know, Hebrews and other passages, again, inform us, we're going to get into this as we drift into chapter six here, that this belief must endure. Okay. You can't just like, well, I I believed, you know, 10 minutes on a Sunday morning 20 years ago, and I prayed this prayer. And now I can, you know, more since I prayed that prayer, I'm in, and now I can more or less, you know, believe whatever I want. No, I'm sorry, that's not the truth. Okay, you must believe. A biblical theology of belief, again, believing, it really involves believing loyalty. Okay, you are loyal, not not that, oh, well, I got to believe and I got to do all these works. That that means, that's how loyalty is defined, doing works. No. No, you believe and you keep believing. You are loyal to that belief. Salvation is by grace through faith, through belief. It has nothing to do with your own merit. You don't earn it. A biblical theology of belief, believing loyalty, remaining loyal to that belief, and of course the object of that belief, which is Christ, you know, what he did, not what you do. That theology of belief does not mean we can pray a prayer of confession and then choose to follow another God or choose to follow another gospel or choose to follow no gospel at all. Belief is not uttering a prayer like it's an incantation. Now, let's think about Abraham, because Abraham's going to be the example in the book of Hebrews. It's the example, you know, in Romans and other passages too. Just a little little hypothetical, you know, pondering here. Let's consider Abraham in a hypothetical way. If Abraham heard from Yahweh, let's say, okay, Yahweh shows up, speaks to Abraham, and Abraham confesses his belief in Yahweh. Then he gets circumcised, and then he later drifted into the worship of another god. Would Abraham have eternal life? Now, for me, that's not difficult. There are no 
Baal worshipers or worshipers of other gods. There are no people who are trusting in other gods in Yahweh's house. You have to believe in what he tells you to believe and stick with it. You have to be loyal to that belief. Israelites, okay, you know, if Abraham just decides, well, I'm going to follow Molech now. I mean, I kind of like Yahweh, you know, and I, you know, I got circumcised and I, you know, I can remember back in that day, you know, I really, you know, I put my faith in him and did what he asked me to do. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the Molech thing now. Okay, he's not going to be there. He's not going to have eternal life. You have to believe. Well, Israelites, the elect. Okay, what about them? Well, you know, okay, they're, they're quote unquote elect, but they masses of them apostatized and went after Baal and Molech and Asherah. Again, what about them? You can have a bunch of Israelites who say they believe in the God of Israel. They do the circumcision thing. They do the festival thing. They observe Torah. They don't eat pork, you know, all this kind of stuff. But if at some point they drift off and they worship Baal, they worship Molech, they worship Asherah and any other deity, they're not believers. They're not believers in Yahweh. They're, they're believing somebody else. They're believing some, some other deity can save them. Okay? You're, you're not going to have Baal worshipers in heaven. You just aren't. And, and again, this is, this, is the, the greatest, this is why it's the greatest commandment, you know, in both Old and New Testament. It's about believing loyalty, remaining in that belief. It's not adding works. Okay, the word loyalty doesn't have, it, have to do with, okay, I believe, and then I got I to gotta do so many of this. I got to do so much of that. I got to spend an hour here and there. No, 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 and no. All right? It isn't about what you do. It's about what you believe. Do you believe, again, in the gospel of grace? Again, that, that it's all about what Christ did, his obedience, not yours. Okay, that, that, that's just, that's the simple truth. And that's what the writer of Hebrews wants us to see, wants his readers to see. Now, it, this, all that kind of makes the comment, again, about discerning good and evil interesting. You know, good, again, is, dra is at least in, includes, maybe not the whole thing about good, but good at least includes grasping the true nature of the gospel. Evil would therefore be following another gospel or altering it or changing it, forsaking faith in what really gives salvation. Again, forsaking faith, turning toward unbelief is different than doubt. You know, the turning toward unbelief intentionally is different than, you know, feeling an uncertainty or, or hearing something and then having, you know, having your, your belief shaken. Well, I got, well, I'm not sure now. I got to, I got to think about this. I got to, I got to, you know, try to answer this question. Again, that isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about a deliberate turning away, forsaking faith, is different than having a doubt. Forsaking faith is a decision. It's yielding to a deception, perhaps, to follow another god or another gospel. Turning from the faith, apostasy, isn't passive. You have to decide to do it. It's something that requires volition and decision. Now, all of that is important as we turn into chapter 6. Look at the first verse. He writes, Therefore, in light of all this stuff, wish I wish we could talk about it, but you, you, you still need the milk, okay? Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Boy, I, you know, I wish we could just get these points down and then move on to the to the really deep stuff. Let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Okay, repenting from dead works, turning from your own dead works and having faith in what God wants you to believe, that, that we should already be past that point, but we're not. That's the problem. So the nature of the gospel, faith in Christ instead of works, should be elementary doctrine that we, we should all be able to move on from. But you know what? Many believers, I know them, you know them, you know them and, and one of them might be you. Many believers still struggle with this. By definition, then, they are not mature believers. It doesn't matter what, what kind of factual knowledge they have in some other area of biblical study. If they can't get over this by what the writer of Hebrews is saying here, they still need the milk. They still need the basic message. They need to, they need to just fully understand it and embrace it. What about this language, foundation of repentance? You know, we we don't, we don't want to, the writer says, I don't want to lay this foundation again. Well, what's the foundation? Well, the foundation is repenting from dead works and having faith, you know, toward God. Well, what, what is that? Well, he doesn't, 
Notice he doesn't contrast repentance from sin with faith toward God. That's not what, I, that's not what he says. He con- the contrast here is repenting from dead works and faith toward God. Those, those are the two things that are, that are juxtaposed there. You know, what, again, I think what he's talking about should be clear at this point. You repent from dead works. Again, this is, think about the gospel, what the gospel really is. It's about Jesus' obedience, not yours. Repenting from dead works is, is turning away from the things that don't save. Your, dead, your works are not going to save you. They are dead works, okay? That, this isn't what's going to give you eternal life. You need to turn away, i.e. repent. Turn away from that stuff. Turn away from thinking that's what saves you. And, and realize what actually does save you is faith toward God, toward you know, what God has promised. God has given promises. And earlier in the, in the book of Hebrews, again, a few episodes back, there was this language about, again, the, the promises of God, you know, that, that, that it, it, they're still on the table to be claimed, you know, that God has promised certain things. Um, that, that's what we need to have faith toward. You know, faith toward God is faith in, in what God has said, what God has promised. You go back to the earlier chapters. How does God say you get eternal life in his home as part of his family and household? The basis of that promise is, as we've seen in really chapters 3, 4, and 5, is believing what God's Son has done, not what you've done or what you're doing. Okay, That isn't the issue. Now, a little bit of a rabbit trail here that I think is, is kind of necessary and Paul in Romans 6, uh, anyway, takes this rabbit trail. When he, you know, if you think about Paul in Romans 4, it's kind of similar to what we have here in, in, in Hebrews, where he's using Abraham as an illustration of, of what faith really is, what the gospel really is, and justification by faith and not works, and all that stuff. And then he, he hits chapter 6 in Romans, and he says, what shall we say then? Are do we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, if, it, if it's not, if salvation is not about anything I do, I guess I can do anything I want. I guess I can just go sin, sin, sin. You know, as long as I believe that Christ is the only means of salvation, I can do whatever I want. And there might be some here in, in, at this point in our study in Hebrews that might be thinking that. You know, again, Paul again actually addresses this in, uh, in, in Romans very bluntly. So, you know, we'll just take a little, little segue, you know, because Paul raises the question. He ran into that. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? His answer is pretty obvious. Verse 2, by no means. Some translations have God forbid. How can we who died to sin, still live in it. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What's Paul's point? We died to sin. In other words, we... we We're united to Christ, is, is, is his point. I mean, that, that's the best way to encapsulate verses 3, 4, and 5. We who died to sin in verse 2, what does that mean? Well, he tells you in verse 3, okay, we were baptized into Christ. We were put into the body of Christ. He uses this language elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It's being placed in the body of Christ. It's being united to Christ. It's being in Christ. We are, we are grafted you know, together with him. There, there, there's all sorts of language and metaphors that Paul uses, and, and not just Paul, but Paul primarily you know, uses to get us to understand or to try to understand that we are sort of fused with Christ. We have become part of his body. We are united to him. Hebrews hints at this in Hebrews 2, where you know, it's Jesus talking about now that we're siblings, we're brothers, we're part of the same family, you know, because of the incarnation and all that sort of stuff. What it's it's really talking about again this this idea that when you embrace what Jesus did on your behalf, you are joined to him. God looks at you know, him, God looks at you, and, and he sees him, because you are, you are embracing what God asked you to embrace. You are embracing what God wanted you to do. And, and, and that's it. Nothing else added to it. Again, you are fixated. You are attached to. You are glomming on. Again, all, you know, however you want to say it. You have become united to what Jesus did for you. You're not depending on what you're doing for you. Okay? It's what he did, not what you do or what you did. You know, we're, we're, we're joined to Christ. So what, what Paul's getting at here in Romans 6 with this, well, you know, if, if it's just about Jesus, I can do what I want. He says, look, we don't sin. You don't sin so that you get more grace. This isn't incremental. So the idea that, oh, well, let's sin so that grace may abound, that shows 
point blank, you don't understand it. It's not something that you, you know, you, you go get infusions of it every day. And if you miss a few, you know, appointments with the grace infuser, then, you know, you're, you're in trouble. No, the grace of God is shown to you through the work of Christ. That doesn't keep repeating. You don't need infusions of it. Okay. You don't need injections. Okay. Or pills or something like that. So the idea that you're going to just keep sort of getting it as you sin shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what you're being asked to believe. So that, that, that's one point. You know, we, yeah, as believers, again, Paul is going to, I'm not going to go through Romans 6, but Paul gets into Romans 6 and, and, and makes the larger point. Look, if you're a believer, if you really, you know, are, are clinging to this belief and you understand it, by definition, if you really understand it, you'll be grateful. You'll be grateful. And, and gratitude is what should motivate you to do what's right and to refrain from doing what's wrong. So if you're living a life of sin, you're either ungrateful, which of course would you know kind of make you wonder, do you really understand the gospel or not? You're either really ungrateful or you in fact just don't get it. You think you do, but you don't. You know, does we have died to sin here mean we've stopped sinning? Think about that. You know, Paul says, you know, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Well, he obviously doesn't mean how can we who stop sinning still live in sin because he knows believers are going to sin. I mean, he knows he sins. So that, 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 that's not what, he, what he's meaning here. He's not saying that how can we who've stopped sinning as though like now we have to throw our works into, into, the, into the pot here. I mean, we have to add a little merit of our own. That's not what he's saying here. But people will read it this way quite mistakenly. It doesn't mean now that you know those of us who stop sinning, or those of you, or those of us who now have found a way to make God happy with us, doesn't mean that at all. Dying to sin again it means being united to Christ, and then imitating Christ. Okay, trying to live in such a way that would honor Him or that would show our gratitude toward Him. It does not refer to this idea of well, now now that we believe the gospel, we have to add moral perfection to it. And that's, that's not what the text says. Our dying to Christ is linked to being united to Christ in his death, his death, which was in our place. Christ died for our sin. We're joined to him in that payment for sin and his resurrection to eternal life. And think about that. The reason we have eternal life is not because we've stopped sinning. It's actually because Christ was raised. And again, we have this joining metaphor. We are part of that. How do we, how do we become part of that? How do we become joined to the body of Christ? Well, it's that simple believe. Again, that's what Paul's message is in Romans 6. It's what the message of the book of Hebrews is here. Uh, look, Hebrews 10.10 10 is kind of interesting. You know, in this regard, and again, a little ahead of ourselves, but that verse says, and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Did you catch that? What, what sanctifies us? Does, the ver does Hebrews 10 say we have been sanctified through stopping sin? We have been sanctified because we've, we figured out how to stop sinning. No. It doesn't say that. It says we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is the consistent message of Scripture. Salvation is about believing in what Jesus did, not trusting or believing in what you do or what you abstain from. And again, if you're really joined to Christ, if you really get it, if you really understand the gospel, you're not going to use the gospel as a means by which to gratify your flesh, to do what you want. People who really understand the gospel are going to try to imitate Christ because they want to honor him. They're not trying, you know, we're not, we don't do works so that we can add our own merits to the gospel. Okay, what you do isn't going to change God's disposition toward you. In any way, because your salvation from the from the get go was not based on you earning God's favor in any way, it's never based on how well you perform. So if if that had if salvation is divorced from that from the beginning, why would we assume later on that somehow God changes the definition of salvation, or that somehow now you know while we were yet sinners, you know God God loved us and He died. Christ died for us. Okay, but but now after we've we've embraced the gospel, now God's watching us, and if and if we sin, He's angry with us. He looks at us differently. Yeah, and we, and we better do something 
to make God happy again. Again, that is that is a, a a way of processing things that shows that you don't understand grace. And by definition, in, in this passage in Hebrews, you're not ready to move on. The writer of Hebrews does have to lay again the foundation of turning away, repenting from dead works. Okay, because you need that. That's what you need. He wishes you didn't need it, but that's what you need. Turn away from dead works and look toward, you know, have faith in what God has said. And it's, 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 it's on one level, it, it, it's a simple message, but on another level, it, it, it really sort of defies human propensity. You know, we want to think that we're contributing something or we're, we're, we, we feel badly enough because, you know, we, we want to imitate Christ. We want to, we want to be useful to God. We want to, you know, please him. But we, we take this desire to please God, and we, we actually take that, that idea, I want to please God. And then we redefine the gospel. We put words in God's mouth. We turn the gospel into something that it isn't, and it never was. Well, again, <laughs> you have to have, you know, in, 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 in the head and the heart, you know, you, you got to know what it is the gospel is and then believe it. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, you know, I'm, you can tell he's frustrated. You know, I wish I could just not have to talk about this again, but I do. So again, just, just one, one little summary, you know, here before we, we run into, you know, the, the real like, you know, apostasy passage here in Hebrews 6. I just want to, again, just for the sake of emphasis, because, you know, we spend a lot of time on grace and then, you know, people, I, I think, you know, you know, people, you know, want to, to talk about, well, what about repentance? What about, you know, good works? And hey, it, it's good to, to not do things that are sin. It's good to do things that please God. But if you take your behavior and you insert it into what God says is the basis for him accepting you and making you part of the household of God, to use terminology in Hebrews. In other words, if, if you add that, here, God, I'm going to help you out a little bit. I'm going to supplement you know, what, what, what the gospel is, you know, no, God says, look, look, I'm accepting you because of the obedience of my son. I'm not looking at your obedience because frankly, you're going to be a disappointment. Frankly, that's unrealistic. Frankly, why would I make the gospel about your behavior when I know you're going to fail? So stop adding it. Stop adding it. And we take this, this, this good compulsion, you know, to please God. And then we, we end up redefining what God says. Well, you know, frankly, God just doesn't like that. <laughs> okay. You know, that, 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 that's a dangerous thing because you can deceive yourself into following you know, a, a gospel that isn't a gospel. That, 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 he's concerned about that. He doesn't like it. So why should we seek to refrain from sin? Why should we try to live a holy life? Well, it's really about gratitude. It's not about merit. And, and that's, that's, that's the struggle for a lot of people. They want to add works to, to the gospel. They, they think they've got to do something to keep God happy with them. You know, it shows, you know, works are designed, you know, works are important because they show to whom our believing loyalty is given. Do you have believing loyalty in the gospel? If you do, if you really understand it, that's not going to make you say, oh, good, great, this is awesome. I can go sin all I want now. Okay, if you really have believing loyalty, you're going to want to do good works. But you're also going to realize that, you know what, these works aren't adding to my salvation. God doesn't require them for salvation. God loves to see them because it shows our gratitude to him. God loves when we're grateful and it, it, it helps, you know, us to be useful, it helps us to be, you know, people that are open to service, you know, where God doesn't have to spend his time correcting us all the time or, you know, chastising us. We can actually be, a, you know, an effective servant it has nothing to do with merit. It has, it's about appreciation. It's about being useful. We practice holiness not to merit God's favor, but to show love and appreciation to Christ, to show the world and its powers where our spiritual loyalty is. God loved us while we were yet sinners, when we were lost, when we gave no thought at all to pleasing God. It was the last thing in our minds. But even, even in, in that state of, of it's the last thing in our minds would be making God happy. God loved us. You don't need to add works to that. It was already there. 
Okay, you don't need to add what's already there. Okay, you don't need to manufacture what is already there. You don't have to make God love you. He already does. He did and does. So we got to get away from this, this mentality. And we have to stop trying to make God love us or to keep God liking us. <laughs> he already did that. He already lo loves us. He already likes us, okay? We had, he had that disposition before we ever cared. We work, we do good works to imitate Jesus, the loyal son of Hebrews 5. We try to be loyal sons too. Okay? We, we, you know, th this is gratitude. It's a gratitude motivation. We're not work. We we're not working for any other reason. We don't work to imit, you know, or we do work to imitate Jesus. That's why we should do it to be grateful to God. We don't work to replace Jesus as the means of our salvation, or to you know plop some works on His lap. Here, Jesus, we're helping you out. Okay, you just got you've got to get past this point. Understanding the role of works, you know what 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 works are really about. They validate something that's already there. Okay, they, they validate your faith. You know, this is James. You know, he, James never says that works are, you know, works earn you merit and, and it has a merit-based salvation. You know, he, his whole thing is if, if you don't have works, then there's like, boy, you know, is your faith real? He doesn't say, well, if you don't have works, then obviously you haven't done enough to earn salvation. No, he says, if you don't have works, is your faith real? Because it's faith that saves you. Is your faith real? And it, it's just, they're, they're just a means to, you know, look at somebody, look at ourselves, you know, and examine ourselves. Again, not in a merit-based system. We don't replace Jesus. We don't need to convince God to love us. He did that while we were yet sinners, before we ever had a single glimmer of a thought that we should care about what God thinks. It was already there. Now, with all that as a backdrop, look at the rest of Hebrews 6. Okay, I'm just going to read, let's just read the, for the, these 12 verses here in Hebrews 6. We'll go with that. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Now, let, let, let's leave the, the basics here. Go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance, you know, turning from dead works and of faith, having faith toward God. Let's be mature, in other words. And that, that's the first verse. Let's be mature. Let's escape from spiritual infancy. Okay, let's, let's go beyond this. Now, verse 2, we also want to, again, leave instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Again, these are basic doctrines is the point here. Let's move past basic doctrines to get to the really amazing stuff you know, back in Hebrews 5. Now, a few words here, washings. And now, Luke Timothy Johnson has... Uh, you know, a little summary of this I think is, is worth reading, so I'm going to read it, about what's referred to here. He says, a teach, this is a teaching about ablutions and the imposition of hands. Okay, this is this phrase, washings, okay, washings laying out of hands. He says, you know, this is, ablutions is sort of a, a ritual term for ritual washing, and then this practice, which he terms the imposition of hands, kind of an interesting phrase. He writes that the term baptisma that's used here for ablutions was used for John's baptism of repentance, also for the ritual initiation practiced by Jesus' followers. Against the same normal term for baptism. But Hebrews here uses the noun baptismos, which is used for ritual Jewish washings. Again, a slightly different form. And for John's baptism. In Hebrews 9.10, Hebrews speaks of diverse washings, diverse baptismois. Together, in, that, in those, that passage, Hebrews 9.10, mentions it together with Jewish practices of eating and drinking. The usage in the present passage suggests the ritual initiation of baptism, but the plural, baptisms, okay, washings, he says the plural is puzzling. We must remember, however, that a single person could conceivably have undergone in sequence a proselyte baptism, circumcision, John's baptism, and baptism into the Jesus movement, again, into, into Jesus' community. So uh, that's the end of his quote. I mean, what, what Luke Timothy Johnson is saying here, that, that the plural is a little bit unusual, shouldn't throw us off, because people might have done this more than once. But the, 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 the same basic point, you know, sort of stands. This is a basic idea. This is a basic practice. This is something connected with, again, sort of the, the beginning point 
of a person's, you know, spiritual journey. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, you know, must we, you know, we go back over this stuff again, again, turning away from dead works, turning toward faith in God, more talk about baptisms, more talk about the laying on of hands, you know, resurrection of the dead. That's important, but it's a basic doctrine. Eternal judgment, important, but a basic doctrine. In other words, we cover this stuff all the time. Can we just talk about something else? We cover this stuff all the time. It's not that these are unimportant items. But they're sort of basic ideas that 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 are at be, become the focus at the beginning point of someone's you know salvation you know experience salvation journey however we want to, we want to put that this is this is the beginning point of being a, a believer being born again okay and you know, however we want to put that this is this this is the kind of stuff you you, you talk about at, at the very beginning but we're you know we're still talking about it can we just move on can we move on to some other you know more more, more deep things verse 3 the writer says well we'll do that this we will do if god permits so he's hopeful that okay you know maybe at some point you know we'll we'll be able to do that and then he you know he, you know he expresses this lament again this lament that we have to go over the basic stuff again including the elementary doctrine of christ i mean how many times do we have to go over the gospel Boy, I'd like to move on. Maybe we'll get a chance to, if God permits. And then he hits verse four. He writes this, and here's here's the the, the most controversial part, you know, of, of the passage. I'm going to read verses four through twelve. For it is impossible, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless and near to being cursed, and in its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, many think of this section of Hebrews, you know, this section of Hebrews 6, they, they believe it teaches that believers who lapse into unbelief cannot return like they are they are just cut off it's over for them many also contend that this section teaches that believers who sin too much or too badly whatever that means like how much is too much and what's too bad they say you know believers that sin too much or too badly lose their salvation now i, I think personally it's easier to see the flaws in the second idea than the first you know since salvation cannot be merited there's a whole host of passages that make that point including material we've seen in Hebrews to this point, since that's the case, lack of merit cannot result, you know, in, in the loss of a thing that can't be merited. So if salvation cannot be earned by good works, it can't be lost by not having good works, okay? Since it's not earned by abstaining from sin, it's not going to be lost when we sin. This is just axiomatic. This is, again, simple, simple stuff, straightforward stuff. Verse 12 you know, sort of actually, you know, deserves some focus here. Um, again, about the, you know, what what's really going on here. If sinning too much or too badly is supposed to be what loses salvation, one would expect moral performance to be what brings salvation. But that isn't what verse 12 says. Okay, Hebrews 6.12. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You have belief and then belief that endures. That's what saves. So if, if we can't say that he's arguing earlier in Hebrews 6 that, oh, wow, well, if, you, if you sin too much, if you don't have enough good works, then you're going to lose salvation. No, because you would expect the contrast then to be in verse 12. Well, you got to work harder, got to work more, got to sin less. That's not what he says. Those who inherit the promises, the promises of eternal life, do so through faith and faith that endures. It's, it's always about faith. So Hebrews 6 actually contradicts, again, this, this losing salvation by committing too many sins or some specific sin or, or something like that. It, it actually contradicts that. 
And frankly, it, it, it denies, again, work salvation. Hebrews 6, again, I think really we, we need to, that, that's where your attention needs to be to help you think through that second, you know, kind of, you know, flaw. And he actually illustrates the point that salvation, those who inherit the promises do so through faith. And, and you know, again, faith that endures, they inherit the promises. And then he, he goes into verse 13. I'm just going to read the rest of the chapter. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope, not our works, okay, to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner. He went ahead of us on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he uses Abraham as an illustration that <laughs> you look at Abraham. Abraham is the one, again, that God counted it, counted his belief, his faith. He counted it to him as righteousness. Again, is Hebrew Jews are going to know the story really well. Abraham was not saved by works. This is this is Paul's point over in Romans 4. He was saved by faith. The line about God countering, counting it, his faith to him, to Abraham as righteousness was before he was circumcised. It has nothing to do with, with, with the works, with the Torah, you know, with rules or whatever, you know, it, it didn't have anything to do with that. And, you know, ultimately what it depends on is God's own character. God's own loyalty to his own promises on your behalf. And frankly, God's loyalty to his promises on behalf of Jesus, because Jesus was the linchpin to his means of salvation, the, the, the salvation he provides for us. And Jesus did the job, and he did it perfectly. He was unblemished. He was validated. He was made perfect, as we read a, a few minutes earlier in, in this book. In this, this chapter. So for God to change the terms after the fact, well, he's not going to do that because of his own character. God swore upon his own self that he would do this. And since you know Jesus you know, did this all, he performs the office, high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, God is going to be loyal to him. And in, in being loyal to him, he'll be loyal to you. He'll be loyal to us. So this is the basis of salvation. Faith and patient, you know, patient, enduring faith. It's not about works. So the, this whole passage in Hebrews 6 about, you know, falling away and being renewed to repentance and, you know, so on and so forth, you know, it's not about works. It's not about committing a specific set of sins or a sin or a specific number of sins. It has nothing to do with that. So let's go back to those, those two things that many, think, many people think. So many people think that this section of Hebrews teaches that if believers lapse into unbelief, they can never return. That was the first idea. And the second idea, the one that we just you know, sort of covered, was that people believe that believers who sin too much or too badly, they're going to lose their salvation. Well, that idea, again, is demonstrably false because of what the rest of the passage says. Now, again, what about the first suggestion? Now, this one, I think, to me, is, is harder you know, to sort of see or at least harder to, to embrace. What about the first suggestion that many people think this section of Hebrews 6 teaches that if believers lapse into unbelief, they cannot return? In other words, God is going to cut them off. Now, it may sound from the ESV like that's what's going on, but I think it's a misreading of some of the wording. So let's read Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 again. For it is impossible, this is ESV, it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm, and holding him up to contempt. Now, you know, first, it, it seems pretty clear that the writer's talking about people whose profession of faith at, at some point was genuine. He's talking about people who believed. Okay, they, they at one point, you know, said, yeah, I believe that. Now, Hagner writes this to make this point. He says, the Christianity of the readers is not in doubt. 
They are described as enlightened, verse 4, meaning that they have been brought from darkness to light. Again, Hebrews 10.32 echoes that idea. They have also tasted of the heavenly gift and the goodness of the word of God. Word here is not logos, referring to Christ as the word of God, but rhema, referring to what God has spoken. The word taste does not mean that they only partook of Christianity partially and did not participate fully, again, in, in Christian salvation and in the gospel. In a similar way, the word taste in Hebrews 2.9 can't mean that Christ did not fully die. Hebrews 2.9, I'll just read it to you. Same word here. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In other words, it's not just a, it's not just a nibble. Okay? It's, I mean, he, he really did it. He tasted death for every man. He really died. So it's not this, this partial idea. So those who have you know, tasted the, you know, the heavenly gift, the, the gospel, Hagner saying, look, these, are, these are, are people who heard the gospel, understood it, believed it. Okay? He writes, again, these people had become partakers of the Holy Spirit, which was a certain mark of genuine Christians. That's the end of his quote. Now, given this assumption, which is with the majority of scholarship, the key line here to me is, is this one. It says, to restore them again to repentance. What repentance are we talking about? Now, most scholars, and I would agree again, argue that this statement in verse 6, and let me just read the verse again so we don't lose the con context. So he says, verse 4, for it's impossible in the case of those who've been enlightened, taste the heavenly gift, share the Holy Spirit, taste the goodness of the word, and all that stuff. When they fall away, it's, it's impossible that, that when, after, the, after that, then they fall away, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance. Okay. So this line, again, to restore them again to repentance, is, is crucial. Now, again, most scholars, again, would, would, would feel that we need, to, we need to connect that statement about repentance, this one in verse 6, with the statement made in verse 1, okay, about repentance. Let me read you verse 1 again. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go into maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Now, if the statement about being impossible to renew them again to repentance has a relationship to this idea of repentance from dead works, if they're connected, if that's the case, then the writer has someone or something specifically in view. Someone who embraced the idea that salvation was by faith in Christ's work on the cross, who then turned away from the true gospel and re-embraced, went back to dead works. Now here in the context of Hebrews, that would be essentially law keeping, Torah keeping. So that so that this person, this person in view, is going back to works salvation. And so they, they would need to again, once more, turn away from trusting in dead works. They would need to again repent from trusting in dead works. Now this person, okay, who no longer thinks correctly about the works problem is in danger of committing an apostasy so serious that the writer of Hebrews, under inspiration, can't guarantee that they, they'll ever return. Now, that's how I take this impossibility language. That language, I think, has to be balanced with God's desire in many passages that those who are trusting in their works turn to, to, to salvation, that they actually turn to the gospel. Trusting in works doesn't make salvation by faith impossible. Nearly everyone uh, neither, nearly every human being who you know is saved turns to Christ from some form of work salvation mentality. You know, some other religion they all teach works. Okay, so the, the the point can't be that trusting in works makes salvation impossible. Rather, the difficulty here is that the person we're talking about rejected salvation by faith. In other words, they understood what the truth was, and then they went back. They went back to works. That that makes that makes the 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 possibility of them sort of coming to their senses, so to speak, makes it much more difficult. Salvation by faith is is no longer like a revelation to them. It's no longer news to them. They've they've been there. They they used to believe that. But now they've turned back to dead works. If they again become disillusioned by their dead work system, where are they going to go? They've already abandoned salvation by faith. This is why, this is why the writer adds the note that those who return to works, again, it's like you know, crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up in contempt 
I mean, if, if they if they reject the, the truth of the gospel, you know, they, they, at one point they saw, OK, I can't, you know, I, I can't be saved by works. So I'm going to embrace the gospel. And then for some reason, they go back to a works mentality. If, if they see the futility in that again, where are they going to go? There is no other sacrifice. There is no other way to resolve the human sin problem. So if they reject, if they've already rejected that, if they've already rejected the cure in favor of a return to works, it really does look like they're just not going to make it back. It really does look like that they can't be saved because they've already rejected the solution. Now, Hagner puts things this way. He says, these Jewish Christian readers who had so clearly participated in the fruit of Christian salvation now contemplated turning away from it all. Nothing could be more serious in our author's view. He insists their apostasy would be a form of betrayal and the shocking equivalent of crucifying Jesus and subjecting him to public shame once again. In effect, their apostasy would be a mockery of the cross itself, unquote. Now, all of that lurks behind this impossibility language. On one level, it still is hypothetical, though, because trusting in works and of it, in and of itself is no obstacle to having eternal life. Most people are saved out of that. The person who trusts in works must, to use the language of Hebrews 6, 1, repent from dead works, turn away from that idea. They have to turn toward you know, believing in God's promises. But on another level, the fact that someone had understood all that and embraced it and then turned from that back to a work system makes any future repentance seem very unlikely, seemingly impossible. Now, I say seemingly because, and I think this is really important in the passage, the adjective used here that gets translated impossible is adunatos. It doesn't have just one meaning. It doesn't always mean impossible. For example, it can generically mean powerless or weak. Romans 15.1, let me read you the verse. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Again, the word weak there is adunatos. Same word here as in, in Hebrews 6. There's no sense of fatalism there in, Hebrews 5, or in Romans 15.1. In other passages, though, it does refer to a kind of an absolute impossibility. For instance, later in this chapter, Hebrews 6.18, we read, it, it is impossible for God to lie. Okay, well, that's absolute. Romans 8.3 would be another one of these. Let me read that one to you. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Okay. That there, there you have that, you know, this, this, this could not do. The law is never going to bring salvation. So that, again, that would be sort of a categorical impossibility. Now, at still other times, we have a generic kind of reference of weakness. We got you know, some, in some contexts, we've got a certain impossibility. I would say, though, that there's even another alternative. At other times, and I'm suggesting that we read Hebrews 6, 4 in this light, the term adunatos refers to more severe weakness or inability and therefore you know great unlikelihood but not absolute impossibility. I think that's what Hebrews 6:4 is talking about. You know that's something that, that's really unlikely, doesn't look like it's going to happen, but it's not actually impossible. Now, here's the passage that makes me think this. The eye of the needle passage in the gospels actually illustrates this perspective. This is Matthew 19, 23 through 26, also Mark 10, 27, Luke 18, 27. Let me just read you the larger passage in Mark. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, let's balance those two sayings. Jesus says, only with difficulty. Will a rich person enter the kingdom of God? He doesn't say, well, there are no rich people in the kingdom of God because they just can't, you know, it's impossible. He doesn't say that. He says it's really difficult. And then he gives this illustration. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person in the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, well, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. There's our word, adunatos. But with God, all things are possible. And of course, in the Gospels, we have the illustration of Zacchaeus, rich man, very rich, and he came to faith. So Jesus' point here is that, look, to people, this might look impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Yeah, it's really hard. 
it's really difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's so hard. It's like, man, it's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. It's really hard. But what man looks at as impossible isn't impossible with God. It's, this is the same term used in, this, in, in that gospel passage as our verse in Hebrews 6. And so I think that is really how we need to read Hebrews 6, 4, that when you have a situation, and the, the bottom line is that when, when, you know, when you have this situation where you have a person who understood the gospel, they had turned from dead works at one point, they really understood the gospel, they believed it, but then they forsake it, they reject it, they reject the gospel, they go back to a work system or in theory, nothing at all. And I, I think even a work system would be harder than nothing at all. But if they go back to the work system, Hebrews 6, you know, 4 through 6 is saying, it's really difficult, it's really unlikely that that person is going to come back to faith. But what we can't say is that it's impossible. It looks impossible to us, but with God, all things are possible. Why is it so hard? Because the unbeliever has to re-believe in the thing that they rejected, that they understood at one point and then they rejected. God has nothing else to offer. There is no other sacrifice for sin. There is no plan B. This is the thing that gives us eternal life. This is the only thing that can do that. And so if they've already rejected it, even after understanding it, that's really hard. It's really hard, but it is not, again, technically impossible. Now, before you know, we wrap up, again, that, that was the, the major point of it, you know, of, of, you know, this, at least this half of the episode, these verses in, in four through six, again, it reinforces the message that, look, this sounds, you know, you know oh, oh, so complicated, but I think that there's, there's a way to, to sort of, you know, uncomplicate it. Just believe. You know, some would question what I'm arguing for here in this idea of you have eternal, you're eternally secure if you believe. If you don't believe, you're not. Okay, some would argue that, that that's inconsistent with concepts like election or passages like 2 Corinthians 1.22 and Ephesians 1.13. When it comes to election, hey, Israelites were elect, but that didn't guarantee salvation. They had to believe. They couldn't profess a belief in Yahweh and then do the circumcision thing and do the Torah thing and the Sabbath thing and then go worship Baal. Okay, the evidence for that, that, that the view I'm articulating here is, is, is correct, that election did not guarantee salvation. You want evidence for that? It's called the exile. Okay, because <laughs> you had a bunch of circumcised Israelites, you know, who, you know, at, at one point, you know, the, the Israelites weren't always, you know, you know, doing all this stuff, but they drifted off into, into worship of other gods and then they paid the price. Their election, Israel was elect, yep, yep, but their election didn't guarantee salvation. Election means something different. I've blogged about that a lot. The exile is also the context for the spirit language in the New Testament. These two verses that I, I referenced, 2 Corinthians 1.22 and Ephesians 1.13. God will not share his living space or his family membership role with other gods. Let me, let me read 2 Corinthians 1.22. This is a verse about that God has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And then Ephesians 1.13. In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be sealed with the Spirit? We act as though it means I have my salvation ticket and can now believe whatever I want or nothing at all. Again, that is to treat the promise of salvation, the gospel message, like an incantation to be uttered or whispered, or a genie's bottle to be rubbed. Okay, sealing is actually about identification. When we are sealed with the Spirit, we are marked as gods, basically in a way similar to the role of works. Works identify those who believe. But works don't merit salvation. Okay, these are identifying characteristics, not that which takes away guilt and sin. Works testify to faith. They do not replace faith or supplement faith so that salvation is merited. Now, the Spirit of God, I would say it works the same way. The Spirit of God, God, his presence residing within us, identifies us as members of his family. But we must believe to receive the Spirit and to remain in God's family. We must keep believing. We cannot turn to another God or another gospel 
Israelites were sealed by circumcision. The Bible actually does use that language. Israelites were sealed by circumcision as part of their election. An election didn't guarantee salvation. Therefore, circumcision didn't guarantee salvation either. Romans 4.11, in fact, separates the sign and the seal of circumcision from salvation. What saved Abraham was his faith, not his circumcision. God's choice, his elective choice to speak to Abraham also isn't what saved him. Abraham had to believe. This is a consistent, simple, straightforward, biblical, theological idea. But we, we, we mar it with the way that things are preached. We mar it with, with theological traditions. I mean, this gets us into the Calvinist idea of perseverance, for instance. But Calvinism isn't a synonym for biblical theology. I'm sorry, but it's not. On one hand, yes, we must persevere in belief. Sure, we have to do that. If we believe we are eternally secure, God guarantees our eternal destiny. If we don't believe, we aren't. There's nothing in Hebrews that guarantees professing believers will continue to believe. That's what the writer fears. That's what he's afraid of, that believers will reject their belief. A Calvinist might say, well, such a statement is a contradiction of Romans 8. Okay, Romans 8, 29, 30, let's just read them. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, I don't see a contradiction. The passage is actually talking about sanctification. Okay? Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. The passage is actually talking about sanctification, which isn't salvation, but of course it's connected to salvation. Think about the passage this way. It is absolutely true that anyone glorified was justified, and anyone justified was called, and anyone called was predestined, and things that are predestined are foreknown, because God foreknows everything, even the stuff that doesn't happen, in which case his foreknowledge doesn't necessitate predestination. But what's the predestinating about? It's about being conformed to the image of God's Son. Now, here's how I read Romans 8. In the context of, of other passages, anyone who keeps believing and who therefore inherits eternal life will be glorified because that's part and parcel of eternal life. It's Hebrews 2. We're made members of God's council family. Now, that person, the glorified person who makes it all the way to the end, is glorified because they were justified. And they were justified because they believed and didn't turn from belief. The person who makes it all the way to glorification was indeed justified, called, and predestined. The latter part really is about remnant theology. But all of that, all of it, depends on believing the gospel. Calvinists want to predestinate belief, but the passage never actually says that. Calvinists want to link predestination with faith and then argue that faith cannot be surrendered because the person's belief was foreknown and therefore must have been predestinated. Well, again, news flash to the hardline Calvinists. God also foreknows people who will forsake faith. The people that the writer of Hebrews is worried about were and are real. In Calvinist logic, their forsaking of faith must also therefore have been predestinated. So not only does God predestinate the the lost in that system, in other words, the non-elect, and one wonders about elect, you know, because the non-elect in the Old Testament later become elect, but let's just set that aside. In Calvinist logic, the forsaking of faith must also have been predestinated. But God also predestinates the loss of what he predestinated earlier. So you have, in the Calvinist system, you've got, okay, those are predestinated to hell. I'm talking about the hardliners here. Those are predestinated to heaven. Well, if God foreknew that some people would have faith and then lose it, you know, they, they, would, they would believe and then, and then abandon it. Well, then now you have God predestinating both the loss of what he had predestinated earlier. If both belief and unbelief for the same person are predestinated because both decisions of that same person are foreknown, that's what you get. This is why Calvinists must say that the people in Hebrews 6, 4, and 5, or Hebrews 6, 2 to 4, the ones who were enlightened, who taste the heavenly gift, who shared the Holy Spirit. Calvinists must say they weren't really enlightened. They didn't really taste the heavenly gift, and they didn't really share in the Spirit. If those people are believers, then God both foreknew and predestinated their embracing of the gospel and their apostasy, because they were both foreknown. One act of predestination unpredestines the other. 
again, look, look at the quandary. You either have to deny in Hebrews 6, 2 through 4, plain language used elsewhere that describes believers and taste the heavenly gift, share in the Holy Spirit. We went, you know, we're enlightened, went from darkness to light. You, you have to deny that, that that refers to believers here when it refers to believers you know, in lots of other places. You either have to deny that to avoid this predestinating and then unpredestinating what was earlier predestinated. <laughs> Look, th this is why systems just complicate things. The person who believes, whose faith remains, was certainly glorified. Okay. Okay. They're they're, they're going to reach the end. They're going to be glorified, and if they're glorified, they were called, they were justified, they were foreknown, they were predestinated. God knows all that. It's when we start to get into this into this causative element that we run into problems. When we link without any qualification, foreknowledge, and predestination, it forces us to deny clear biblical language for salvation in Hebrews six. Else, our system sounds ridiculous. That's just what you get. It's so much simpler to just affirm what the text says. Okay, that, that's what we try to do here in the podcast. Here are the simple facts as we wrap up. Salvation is only by faith or belief in the one who secured it, the one who secured atonement. That's Christ. It's Hebrews 1 through 5. We've been there for weeks now. Number two, we must all repent. We must all change our thinking about dead works. We, we have to stop behaving, living, thinking as though our works can save us. They cannot save us because there's no merit. Third, we cannot sin away salvation because salvation was never about doing enough good works or abstaining from enough bad works to merit salvation. But salvation can be rejected even by those who once claimed to believe it. You know, once people who profess to believe it, they can reject it. Four, it is very unlikely that anyone who believes the gospel and then rejects that same gospel to return to dead works will come back to faith. It's very unlikely, but it's not truly impossible. It's just very unlikely. Fifth, we are therefore eternally secure if we believe. That, that cuts through the whole thing. It cuts through all the mess. We are eternally secure if we believe. If we don't believe, we aren't. Yet I'm tempted to say, don't go away from this episode scared and say, oh, this is so hard. What do I do? How can I be saved? Well, it's actually easy. But the writer of Hebrews actually wanted his readers to feel a little trepidation here, because belief is eternally serious. I would say that the takeaway from Hebrews 6 in this episode is the same that we've already seen. You can actually reduce the takeaway to one word, believe. Or What's that journey song, <laughs> Don't Stop Believing? Actually, yep. it comes to mind on that. <laughs> but uh you know, but, I was going to say, leave it to you to think of that, Trey, but, but you actually have a point. <laughs> Let, let's edit that out <laughs> where I admit that. <laughs> no, but I think this repentance and works versus uh, grace and faith uh, is very important. I, I've never really been able to articulate grace versus uh, repentance or works versus faith and uh, that, but... I think what you're doing here now is giving us a tool that we can say, here you go, go listen to episode 184. Or, yeah, so the, the merit is the key. You know, why do, why are you doing, you know, Christian, why are you doing the works that you're doing? If you're doing them thinking that you need to do them to keep God happy, that you, you, you want God to still look at you the way he did, you know, a year ago, a week ago, whatever, then you don't understand grace. The, the correct answer is I'm doing this because I'm grateful. I'm doing this to be like the obedient son. I'm doing this to be like Christ. I know it doesn't earn me anything. I just want to do it. And you have a lot of Christians that really pound home the repentance. They, they can't get over that. They're stuck on it in the works. And uh... Right. And, you know, if we're living in sin, we ought to repent. But again, why are you repenting? Are you repenting because you're convinced that you made your profession of faith and you really do believe you know, in the gospel. But are you repenting now because you want God to love you? Are you repenting now thinking that you need to get saved again? Uh, you know, you, you, merit is the issue. Are you repenting so that now you can feel like you've earned salvation? A lot of Christians would, would say like, no, I mean, I, I would never think that. Well, that's good. So hold that thought in your head. 
your act of repentance, yes, you need to, you know, you need to stop cheating on your wife. You need to, you know, repent of X, Y, Z. You, you need to repent. But when you do, I'm glad to hear that you know you're not doing it to earn salvation. You're doing it because it makes you less useful to God. It's a terrible testimony. It's self-destructive. It's going to destroy people around you. Lots of good reasons to repent. But we don't repent so that we can redefine the gospel. That's not why we do it. But a lot of people are just stuck in that loop. And, and, and that's why guilt is such a factor. You know, they, you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't, if we're deep in sin, we shouldn't feel guilty. I'm not saying that. But once you do repent, the, the cycle of guilt shows that you're really stuck in this loop of you wonder if you're good enough now for God to like you again. That in, in itself is really self-destructive. That shows that you haven't quite escaped from this mentality that says, what I do is really important to the way, you know, to, to whether God loves me or not. And, and that, that is something, th those are two things you have to clearly distinguish in your head, uh, you know, to be able to, to move on. So yes, you know, live a holy life. Yes, repent from sin, but understand the relationship of your repentance, your behavior, your works, to how God looks at you. While you were yet a sinner, before this ever would have been a conversation, Christ died for you. He, he had the disposition way back there. He doesn't, you're not going to give him the disposition toward you that he already has. All right, Mike. Another good episode. Next week, Chapter 7, Melchizedek. Getting back into Melchizedek. <laughs> Who? <laughs> Who? We got more to say about it. We can't get rid of that guy. <laughs> yeah. 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 There there are a few there are specifically two thing two places we're gonna drill down on that. But yep, yep. He's he's coming back. He's I, back. I figured you all you it's gonna be a five minute show, you're just gonna reference <laughs> the past. Go listen to that other yeah. stuff. Yeah. Go listen. <laughs> no. I figured that's what it'll be consistent of. But uh all right, Mike, we're looking forward to that. Uh and again, uh if you haven't done so, go rate us, review us, wherever you consume us. Let us know how we're doing. And uh, we want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 